All right. So I put this uh, ineffective sorts back up here if you want to take a look at it. Um, sorry, the font's kind of small from back there. Uh, but um, the, uh, these maybe make a little more sense after working on your homework assignments and working on your, uh, or like learning the stuff from last week. Hopefully, homework five is going all right. Going all right, got the sorts underway. Getting there, hopefully it's not too bad. Um, remember, it's due Wednesday night. And uh, the next homework assignment is going to be like out Wednesday as well, uh, maybe Thursday, uh, just based on, uh, based on the fact that we've got one more assignment. And uh, the final assignment's the hardest one, I'd, or probably the longest one, I'd say. You have to write like three programs. Two are kind of intense. One's kind of a baby program. Uh, and you have to do most of that on your own. I will make it a little bit easier for you based on something we, we uh, are talking about today. The last time this assignment was given was a few years ago, and it included two-dimensional arrays, but two-dimensional dynamic arrays, which are kind of painful. Uh, it's not too bad, but they're kind of painful. Um, so I'm going to let you use uh, what we call vectors, and we're going to teach you how to use a vector today. And part of the reason I'm teaching you how to do that is because uh, for instance, I'm not sure if the person's here. I don't see the person. I was talking to someone who's in your class about an assignment that she's doing in another class. And she wanted to use C++. And she came to me and said, hey, I'm doing this. And I'm going to use a dynamic array. And after looking at it for a while, I said, you know, this is kind of all of a sudden, yes, it's still school, but this is like more real life. I, I think you should pro you're probably better off using the built-in dynamic array called the vector. And I realized that you guys would, might get out of this class without ever using a vector. And that seems a little ridiculous because C++ does have more uh, higher level like classes and things that you, uh, uh, that you can use in real life. Now, you, for this class, most of the time we don't let you because we want you to understand the underlying uh, rules. But uh, as far as um, going forward, you might at least need to know about that. So anyway, we'll talk about that. OK, here's what we're doing today. Guess what? We are finally on to hashing. Woohoo! I don't know if you remember the first day of class, I put up a whole bunch of containers. And the fastest one in almost all categories was the hash table. So today, we are going to talk about hashing and hash tables <coughs> in general. And then we're going to talk about why they're so fast. And uh, we're also going to uh, kind of lead into some more different types of hash tables for next class as well. So finally, we're getting to this hash table. And we will talk all about why hashes and hash tables are so important for a lot of languages these days. So we're going to get there. Or we're finally there. OK? All right. So here's what we're going to talk. I'm going to introduce this thing called a vector. Um, so as I said, it's going to be a little bit easier to use a vector than uh, than to use a dynamic two-dimensional array. But vectors do have a little bit of a learning curve themselves. So you'll have to understand those and how they work. Um, but I, I do think once you, get, once you understand them, you'll go, oh, this actually is a little easier than the other one. And then we will start using 2D vectors in today's lab called Image Engine, which I think is going to be a fun lab because you'll actually get to manipulate images and see the results of those images. So kind of fun. Okay? And then we'll go into hashing. So it's actually going to, there's a lot of stuff jammed into this lesson. Questions before we get going? Homework five, homework six. Any, I'll introduce homework six on Wednesday. Well, kind of today a little bit. Yeah? Um, for the comments on the last homework? Comments on the last homework, yeah. I think I got a point off for having too many comments. Okay, point it for too many. That makes, I can understand that. Sure. Yeah, you can absolutely have too many comments. Don't comment like, for loop. I mean, that doesn't tell anybody. That just wastes space, right? Don't comment things that are obvious to a programmer, right? Comment things like, why are you going only going up to i plus one instead, or why are you only going up to i minus one instead of i, or why do you start at one, or you know, what's actually happening here? Remember, comments are more about the why, not the what. Like, why am I doing what I'm about to do? That's kind of what the you know. You can you can say, look, you can say. Uh, uh, partitioning the array. That's, in kind of, that's, that's something important, right? You don't want to say, oh, calling a recursive function. Right? That doesn't help you much, right? I mean, you can say, you know, recursively calling each side or something. That might be important, right? But saying just, you know, recursion. Anybody who knows what recursion is is going to understand that. So, yeah, that's a legitimate comment. If you want, I can take a look at it directly and see where, where they might be. 
Yeah, Nate. Nee. Uh, why not use an array? So you, can, you could put in a, well, there is no array.length function for an array, right? So that doesn't exist, right? How do you find out the length of an array? You count up how many elements are in it, right? Or you could use a dynamic array that actually has another, like it's a dynamic array class. But I just wanted to make it simple for you, a simple struct with an, ar- that, an array in it, and it keeps the length around as well. That's all. Yeah, it was simpler than a whole class. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. And besides the fact that you don't have to remove ever from the array, it's always going to be the same size and so forth. Any other questions? OK. All right. Let's talk about vectors in particular. So the final project is actually going to include some 2D grids. You're going to have to think about this when you're constructing your uh, results. Who here has played the game Boggle before? OK. Who hasn't played Boggle before? Oh, boy, boy, a lot of you. OK, so this is a game. I actually grew up with this game. I actually kind of didn't like it because my vocabulary wasn't very big. And it like relies on you having, having to have a big vocabulary. Here's how Boggle works. Okay, You have a board, and it's a little board. And in there, there's a bunch of dice that have letters on them. Okay, And the letters, if you shake this board up and then like kind of shake it around, the letters settle such that one side of each die is, is facing up. And it might be like this. It might be like T. R, E, L, um, Q, U. That's one letter for some reason. They, they decided that Q needed a U always, so they just put it in one letter. All right. K, uh, M, O, A, B, X, R, another R maybe, I, L, L, something like that. And once you have this set up, and by the way, some of the letters are actually some of the letters because they're dice and you can't like do it some of the letters might be like this way so you have to kind of tip your your head or whatever but what it's doing is it's setting it up so then you the little game you've got like 2 minutes and the game is to find as many words as possible by going starting at a letter going let's say starting at k going left diagonal up diagonal up diagonal you can either go left or you can go up down left or right or any of the diagonals to get to the next letter OK? Homework, what was the question? Do you have to get in order? Do you have to, get in, you have to go in order yeah, of the letter. Yeah, you have to go in order of the, of the word. So can anybody find a word on here? More than three letters. It's got to be more than three letters. What on? No, never mind. OK. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Amanda. B-I-L-L. B-I, whoops, I-L-L. Yeah, B-I-L-L. That would work fine. OK, yeah, another one? Uh, roll. Roll. R O. L E R O L E. Yep, that's one. Now, can you guess what the assignment's going to be? First of all, you'll be given a dictionary and you have to find all the combinations, like all the words that match. Second of all, that's one program. The second program is going to be if I give you a list of words, like you, the person playing the game, will get the, give a list of words and you have to figure out if all those words are actually in here. That's the second part. And the third part is scoring it. And you get like one point for three letter words, two points for more letter words, et cetera. Okay? So that's going to be the idea. But notice this is a nice square like setup here. And you can model this with a two dimensional array, right? Rows and then columns. Okay? So that's how we're going to, that's what the pro- project is going to be about. Now, who here wants to write a dynamic array for a two dimensional structure? Let me give you my answer. <laughs> Not me. Now, it's not impossible, obviously. And I'll actually give you extra points if you, if you do go ahead and do the 2D, 2D, 2D array. This is the way the project was before. You can also do a linked list. You can do an array with linked lists. You, can do whatever you, you could do whatever you want. In fact, I will let you do whatever you want. But I'm going to allow you to, do vector, to use vectors, which I think will simplify the problem pretty significantly. In fact, Bruce tells me it might make it trivial. And I don't think it's going to be trivial. <laughs> but um, I, do, uh, I, I, I think it's better that you know about these things and be able to use them at the possible expense of making a slightly easier project. Anybody have a problem with that? You want a like, harder assignment? OK. Um, so here's what an, a vector is. It is basically a straight up two-dimensional or sorry, a straight up dynamic array where all of the details like expanding or uh, making sure that, uh, that you're not out of bounds or whatever is all handled for you. 
Okay, it's all handled for you. It's just a container. We have seen containers like this before. Remember the queue and the stack containers that you used in one of the labs. Okay, uh, you've got the standard library vector container as well. Okay, uh, vector elements. What's nice is that you can access the vector elements using the bracket notation too. It's just a dynamic array, so you can say my vector bracket four, and that will give you the fifth element in your vector. Okay, so it's nice. You can also get a size. So uh, when Nathan says, "Why can't we just get a size of an array?" Arrays don't have sizes built in, but vectors do. So you can call the function size for a vector, which is kind of nice. Okay, yeah. No, it's if if I read if I wrote that wrong, it's the it's the index ten, okay. not the tenth. It's the eleventh. I guess it would be. Yeah, the eleventh element. Okay, so that's what a vector is. Let me show you a, a little program on how to use a vector. Sorry, it's kind of small. I'll, I'll expand this for you. There we go. Okay. Um, here's what you can do. Now, there are two things going on here. There is a vector, and then there's a regular static array. Okay, and what we're going to do is copy the static array into the vector. It seems a little weird to do, but I'm just, just showing how this works. Here's how you define a vector. You say vector, and then you give it a type. It can take any type. It can take a struct. It can take another vector. It can take a, a queue. It can take whatever. You can have a vector of objects, which is one of the higher level notions of these things. Okay, and then you give it a name. All right, you can add to a vector by using push back. Okay, if you do push the num the vector name dot push back, and then what's what you're trying to push back, it will place it at the end of the vector. Okay. You can also do push front, I believe, which will put it at the front of the vector. Now, because these are dynamic arrays under the covers, you still are bound by the asymptotic complexity of arrays, which by now I expect you guys will know. For instance, what's the asymptotic complexity of pushing to the back of a vector or back of a dynamic array? Constant. Okay, very good. What's the asymptotic complexity of pushing to the front of a dynamic array? Linear. Okay, it's exactly the same for vectors. You don't get any like special magic out of vectors just because it's built for you, right? If you push full on the front, it will take linear time to push all your items on there. Okay, for each item, it's linear time. Okay, makes sense. You just have to know that when you're using this. I don't want to see a lot of people pushing on the front of these things when they don't have to. Okay, all right. So that's the the setup. Now, how do you actually walk through or access the elements? Well, it's actually kind of neat. Okay, you can do a couple things. You can, let's see if I can. There we go. Okay, you can use a regular loop to go through a vector. How would you do that? There's this thing when you do the size of a vector, it gives you the value call and the type that it returns to you is a type of size t, size underscore t. All that is is an integer type. Okay, it happens to be a 64-bit integer. Okay, and what that means is that it's like able to hold lots and lots of numbers. I believe it's actually I might be wrong in that. It might be an unsigned 32-bit integer. It might be an unsigned 64. I'm not sure, but it's a positive integer. You can cast that to a regular integer. You could say something like this. You could say um, uh, int i equals my vec size. And if you did that, it would probably it might give you a warning and say, hey, you're trying to convert a bigger integer to a smaller one. But if you do int i equals uh, equals parentheses int my vec dot size, what that does is that says, okay, I know what I'm doing. I know that my size of my boggle board is not 14 billion, and I'm going to allow you to convert it to an integer. Directly, okay. So that's like it's faking out the compiler, or it's like telling compiler, "Hey, don't give me a warning. I know what I'm doing." Okay, so you're allowed to do that. That's all. That's all that. In this, I just showed you that it's a size t. But notice what we're doing. We're going through a regular old for loop here from zero up to the uh, size that we just got, right? It's less than the size, and then we're incrementing i, and then when you're printing out the list. It just prints out. You just use the bracket notation, just like you would any other array. So it should be it should be uh, recognizable to you in that sense. Question. So if you replace size t with int there, what's the 
If you, replies, if you replaced size t here and here, it would still work, but the compiler might give you a warning depending on your uh, depending on with what your flags were that you set up. Yep. I, uh, if you, it's converting it and it's losing precision, in other words. So you don't want to lose precision generally, so the compiler will warn you. Yeah. And you could have a vector that has 10 billion elements in it and that wouldn't fit in a regular int, for instance. Yeah? Um, is there a difference between plus plus i and i plus plus? There is a difference. Anybody know what the difference is? Yeah? Yeah, plus plus i increments the value first and then uses it. And then i plus plus uses the value, then increments it. It turns out in a for loop it doesn't matter because the, 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 when it gets used is like at the end of the loop. So it doesn't actually matter. Like it'll get used. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, question here. So then how does this creep down a 2D array to go? Ah, we're not talking about 2D arrays quite yet. Oh, okay. okay we're, not, we're not getting into 2D arrays. And keep that question. We'll get to that. Any other questions on this? OK, there is another way that's built into all these standard containers to loop through a container. It's kind of cool. It's called using an iterator. All these containers have what we call an iterator, which allows you to walk through the elements in a much safer way. Couldn't I put uh, i is less than string list size plus 400? And it would l gladly let me do that until the program seg faulted, right? In the other case, if you try, if you do it with an iterator, it won't seg fault. It'll actually what we call throw an exception. That's beyond the scope of this class, but it's um, it will it's it's more it's safer to use than uh, the other way. But here's how this works: you declare the iterator, and you have to put this vector strings. It needs to know what kind of iterator it is. Oh, it's an iterator of vector strings, okay? And you then say, hey, start at the beginning of my vector. That's the first element of my vector go until the end of my vector. Now, as it turns out, string list.end is actually the one past the end. So it'll go and do the last one and then iterate one more time and say, oh, I'm at the end and I'm done. Okay? But that's how you iterate through it. Yeah? Not, no, we still have to do the plus plus i. Right? This is all one line. All one line, right? The, but what this is saying is now, our iterator is a pointer to the element that it's at. So what you do when you print it out is you say dereference that pointer, and that will give you the element back. OK? So that's how it actually works. All right? It will actually, it, you can walk through these things, and you will be able to dereference it this way. I don't care which one you use. This one tends to be more C++-like in real life. This one is simple and works, and everybody understands it. So it's a, it's a toss up. Yeah, Andrew. Is there supposed to be a semicolon after the word iterator? Uh, is there supposed to be a semicolon? No, because this is the type and this is the, na the name. So it's a type. The entire type is vector string colon colon iterator. That's the type. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it called a vector? Why is it called a vector? Uh, I think it's probably a physics kind of definition where you've got a vector is a list of elements in a row. Yeah. I think that's what it is. OK, so that's how we use the iterators, OK? I mean, the, the iterators and how we walk through it. Ar arrays will take a little bit of time to get up to speed with, but I, I guarantee they're going to be easier once you learn them, because it's, a lot of stuff is handled for you. OK? Yeah? Whoops. Oh, yeah, we'll get there. Okay. Let me show. That's the next slide, actually. A two-dimensional vec vector is the one you're, is that what you're asking about? Yeah, I was just wondering, can you put spaces like after the first vector or that? Yeah. Uh, is your OCD coming in and it's like you want to have it there? Yeah. So, so here's what's going on with a 2D vector. You can make a vector of vectors. Okay? How do you do that? You say my vector is of type vector of some type. So it's a vector made up of vectors. It's just like a two-dimensional array in the sense that a two-dimensional array is an array of arrays. Okay? In the definition here, the only thing that makes difference is that you have a space after the type and before the, like after the, that angle bra bracket and that angle bracket, because this is an operator that we know well, right, for C in. The compiler can't figure out if you mean something like C in for that unless you put a sp space there, right? If you mean, it doesn't know. So you have to put that space there. 
it's kind of ugly. And, and when you get to programming languages and when you get to compilers, if you ever take compilers class, you'll learn all about parsing and why that's hard to do. So you'll learn about that. But this is how you declare a two-dimensional vector. Again, it's a vector of vectors. Okay, And that's this kind of like dual definition you've got to wrap your head around a little bit. How do you actually use these things? Well, first of all, you can access them just like you would a two-dimensional array, which is awesome. You can say the name of the vector, bracket x, bracket y, and that gives you the x row and the y column of your array. So you go, x gives you how far down, and y gives you, or, and the y gives you how far over. Okay, that's how the, the vector actually works, or the, the uh, two-dimensional vector actually works. So it's nice. Again, you don't have to worry about like the details of under the covers, making sure you expand everything. You, yeah. What does size return in this case? Oh, that's a good question. I believe I believe size will return the outer, like the number of rows, basically. Okay, because that's what this is made up of, right? The first vector, the inner vector, is the column per row. And the outer vector is the number of rows. So I believe it will return the number of rows. You can check it, but I believe that's what it does. Okay. All right. So that's how you that's how you, you can use them. Now, how do you get your items into your vector? This is the tricky thing. When you're creating a two-dimensional vector, none of the elements are already created. Remember what did you guys in Comp 11 do the snake project? Remember how you were given an exact size and you could just say the, the snake project is going to be 32 by 64, whatever it was, in size, the, the screen. You can't do that for this. Okay? What you have to do is you have to basically create your two-dimensional vector one row at a time. So you create a row. And by the way, this is just a vector of your type called row. And then you push back all the elements you want in the, in the row. And then you push that row back onto the two-dimensional vector. Because remember, it is a vector of rows. right? It's a vector of vectors. And each vector has columns in it. And the whole thing is a vector of rows. Okay? So that's how that works. First, you have, to, you have to create it each time. Now, on tonight's lab, if you want, you could, did everybody get my email about tonight's lab through Piazza? Hopefully you did. Please read the document before you get to lab, because it it's kind of long. And there's not really time during the lab to do it. Um, we'll go over the lab a little bit today in a second. Um, but the idea is we will actually we do some of this for you in the reading in of these images. So you certainly can go look at that. And, and I, strong, I would strongly suggest using the lab as a template for how to use 2D arrays when you get to the pro pro final project. OK? All right, questions on this? Create a row, push that row onto the whole onto the 2D vector, create another row, push that on. You can have a row of strings. You can have a row of, we're going to have rows of uh, red, green, blue pixels tonight for the lab. Whatever, whatever type you want. Yeah. So there's no way of creating the inner vectors within the scope of the inner vector. You have to create them separately. Yeah, you do, well, there, you, you, could, you could initialize it by doing a couple loops where you walk through and initialize everything and push on dummy values or something. You could do that. But it doesn't happen for you automatically. Neither does it happen for you automatically in a two-dimensional uh, regular dynamic array. You have to create the inner array separately than from the other one. So you have to, you can't, it's, it's the same thing there. You don't get it for free. Yeah. OK. You probably, there, there might be functions where you could get it for free, to tell you the truth. But in this case, we don't need to. Uh, in Java, you probably can, yeah. Not in here, though. OK. All right. So that's 2D vectors. Now, Let's talk about today's lab and tomorrow's lab. This is called the Image Engine. I spent all day yesterday creating this lab. I hope it's kind of fun for you. But here's what it is. You're going to be given a bunch of images. okay? And those images, you are going to write the functions that will do some manipulations of those images. okay? What are some things we can do to manipulate images? You can, what's that? Crop, crop them. We're not going to do crop tonight, but you could. Mirror, yeah. them. mirror them. Yeah, you can do a mirror image. You can do a flip. We're actually going to do, uh, let's see, scaling up and down. We're going to mirror them, we're going to flip them, and we're going to shift the colors of the image. OK? Shift the colors is, um, uh, I'll show you that, and I'll show you a demonstration of that in a minute. 
What we're going to use for these, the, so the images are based in a PPM format. If anybody's ever looked into image formats before, you've got JPEGs, you've got GIFs or GIFs or whatever, whichever you want, whichever side you're on on that argument. You've got, uh, you've got PNGs, you've got lots of different ways of storing images that are compressed. This PPM format is a totally uncompressed format, which means the file sizes can get huge. <laughs> okay? What it has, what the PPM format has, it's, it's relatively simple. And you can look at this in the, in the, uh, uh, in the lab. But it's basically a struct that ha or uh, the file itself basically has some magic number that says, hey, this is of type PPM. Right? And then it has uh, like the number of rows and the number of columns. And then it has uh, a number that basically says, what's the biggest integer for an individual color? Many times you'll see it as 255. Red, green, and blue are all up to 255, as it turns out. Okay? And then it starts having this, this image data, which are triplets of red, green, and blue pixels data. So each pixel has three numbers associated with it, a red, a green, and a blue. So then after this, it might be like 0, 0, 0, which would be all, uh, let's see, all black image. Like that pixel would be all black. Okay? And then it might be. Uh, 0, 0, 2, 55, which would be all blue, right? And then it would be, uh, let's say, um, 0, 2, 55, 2, 55, which would be all green and blue combined to make what? Magenta, I believe, right? So it's magenta, right? So that's what that one would be. And then this is repeated for how many rows there are. So three sets of three repeated. You will not need to know too many of the details about this, but you'll need to know how to manipulate just the image data. Okay, you'll do that in tonight's lab, and we'll practice this a little bit. Okay, here's how some of these work. In fact, I give you this image here. Okay, here's the original image. If you scaled it by two times, it becomes twice as big. Now we're saying you you can feel free to play around with this on your own time, but for night for today and tomorrow's lab, scaling by two times means in both directions, both. This way and this way. Images are all going to be rectangular, okay? Not necessarily square, but rectangular. And you're going to scale them like this. You're also going to be able to scale them down by like factors of two or three or five or whatever, okay? You're going to be able to mirror them. You're going to be able to flip them, and you're going to be able to do psychedelic. And psychedelic means that you're you're shifting the colors like this. Red becomes blue. Blue becomes green. Green becomes red. So you're going to shift. Like this one would be, instead of 0, 255, 255, it would be 255, 255, 0. Okay, that's how it's going to work for, your, for, your, uh, for the psychedelic. Okay? I said earlier I should have waited until April 20th to do this one, this lab. Um, so anyway, this, uh, so you'll, you'll, this is the most fun one to do. Okay? This is, the, I think, the most fun one because the results are kind of funny. If you look at various, um, various uh, images, they're kind of fun. Okay, so that's how you're gonna do that. Now, let's talk about how we might do this. Here's what I want you to do. Here's, here's what I'm, I'm gonna draw a little image up here, and I'm gonna pretend that each pixel, in this case, this is not really the way it is, but let's pretend that each pixel is like a little letter, and we have the, the following little image A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay? Let's say that we go from A, B, C, D, E, F is our image. Okay? This is an individual pixel, individual pixel, individual pixel, 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 pixel. We want to double the size of A, B, C, D, E, F in both directions. Okay? Talk to your neighbor and see how, think about how you might be able to do that. Let me give you another example. Instead of A, B, C, D, E, F, let's pretend it was like this. Here it was like just pixels like this. If you like pixels instead of that, there's your image like that. Let's say, like I want them to turn that into doubling the size. Okay, talk to your neighbor. See if you can figure out how to double the size and come up with a little algorithm to do it. This is not that fancy as it turns out. Okay, talk to your neighbor.
Okay. First question, before, before somebody answers, first question. How many A's are going to be in the resulting image? Four. Okay. You have to figure out how that's going to happen. Okay. Who thinks they have a good algorithm for doing this? Well, no, I know you do. Somebody from like this side of the room. We'll get there. No, you, you, you have an idea. Yeah, go ahead. Well, this is, this is going to be a 2D vector. Okay. It won't auto expand. No. No. Uh, how about this? How about give me two loops? Actually, it's going to end up being, I think, four loops as it turns out, but you, you'll see why. It's, it's not, not that bad. You'll see why in a sec. Go, hold, pause on that thought. Yeah, Janelle. OK, I, I like that. Well, is this what you were going to say? Yeah. OK. You're going to double each element, right? So starting with the first row, we're going to create a new row. And we're going to say A, A, and then B, B, and then C, C. And how do you do that? Well, for each element in the row, you do a little for loop from 0 to 1 that doubles it, right? And you could triple it or quadruple it. It doesn't really matter. You're just going to, for each element, you're going to just do that. And you're going to push each element onto that new row. So A gets pushed, then another A gets pushed, then B gets pushed, then another B gets pushed, then C gets pushed, right? Now you've got a double row, a whole row. What are you going to do with that row? You're going to duplicate it. So you're going to take this whole row, and you're going to push it how many times into your new image? Twice. Same amount of times as your factor, right? So we're going to end up with A, A, B, B, C, C. And that's the first two rows of our image. Because we've double, duplicated the A's. And we've duplicated this row. You see how that works? Now, what about for the next one? Same process, right? It's going to be D, D, E, E, F, F. And then we're going to duplicate this row, D, D, E, E, F, F. And notice, now we've got a, an image that's twice as wide and twice as uh, high. And it's duplicated like this. Now, are there other ways of duplicating, of making images bigger, scaling them? Sure. This happens to be a really easy one. Right? I'm not trying to make this like rocket science tonight. This is going to be uh, for this lab. It's going to be kind of simple. Now, question. How would you have this one? How would you make it half the size? Because we want it to come back to this one, right? What would you have to do for that? Any ideas? Yeah, go ahead, Erica. Oh, no? OK. Winona? You definitely want to take out every other row. We're losing information here, right? But what about a co for the columns? Um, same thing. For every, so you go through each column and you go, you skip one. Instead of I plus plus, you go I plus equals two. And you go this one, then this one, then this one. And then you skip this row, and then you do this one, then this one, then this one, and you skip the next row, and you're done. And you, put, and you create a new row. Let's do it. You create a new row, and you push on every other one. A, then B, then C, skip, a, skip a, a row, and then push on every other one of the next row. D, E, F. Right? So now you've halved the size of that. So you see the idea here. These are just loops, as it turns out. They're not hard, they're just loops. But you're going to practice using the, the thing. Yeah, uh, go ahead. When you're, making, when you're making these new vectors, yeah. say you wanted, you extend it, and then you wanted to delete yep. it and make it back. Yep. You create an entirely new image. Now, there's a function in there that we do that for you. We create a new image, but it doesn't have the color data. For the color data, you need to, put the, you need to create a 2D vector. So what you do first, it, it turns out you do this. You say vector RGB, right? And then you can call it row. That will create a row with no elements in it. Then you push, push, push. And then what do you do to this row? You push it onto the images colors vector, as it turns out. And then, you okay. and then you actually copy the old one to the, the new one to the old one. Oh. Okay, So it works that way. Okay, So that's how you do uh, the other one. Let's quickly go through a couple of the other ones. How would you do a mirror image? If you want to mirror A, B, C, D, E, F, right? the mirror image of that is going to be C, B, A, F, E, D. right? So how do we get CBA out of this? Yeah? Uh, just find the middle element, and then uh, whichever element is the same distance from the middle element, flip them. 
You could do that. That sounds a bit more, more work than I was expecting. How about this? Yeah. Yeah, find the size and go do the reverse, like just walk through the array backwards. Right? You could do that. OK? That's that. To flip, to flip upside down, it's going to be A, B, C, D, E, F becomes D, E, F, A, B, C. So which order do we go through the rows? Backwards, right? So you see how these are all just for loops? You're going to get lots of practice on that. Psychedelic's an interesting one. Psychedelic, you have to go through each, each one, and you basically are saying A becomes some, like the three values in there shifted. So it becomes like, we'll call it A or something, uppercase. And then B, lowercase b becomes uppercase b, and lowercase c becomes uppercase c, et cetera. OK, you're doing a little shifting per pixel. OK? If you get done with all of those, that'll be really impressive for like a one hour, one and a half, or one hour, 15 minute lab. Because the TAs are going to go through some of this again. But um, the one that I want you to definitely get done is the scaling one. The other ones are all, I'm not going to grade off if you don't get them. The, 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 when you provide it, it'll say not the same. But I'm not going to grade off. This is the only one I care about you getting done. But I want you to work on the other ones. Right? Don't just leave after you get scaled. I want you to work on the other And I think you'll find it fun, especially when you see the images afterwards. Okay? Any other questions? All right. OK, that's the lab. I, I do think you'll enjoy it. Okay. Hashing. Switch your brain over to a new, new mode. We are going to talk about hashing in the following way. Okay? Just like with, with heaps or with priority queues in general, we can have keys and their values. For today's lecture, we're going to talk about the keys being a word and the values being the definition of that word. Okay? So if I gave you the word ox, you might say that's a bovine trained as a draft animal. Of course that's what an ox is, right? You give me that. But what we want to do is we want to store these key value pairs in a nice efficient data structure. Okay? And that's what hashing is all about. We've talked about a number of these things already. We've talked about lists and stacks and trees. They all have their downfall, right? And I'm not saying that hash tables don't. But these have the downfall that if you're trying to do find, insert, and remove, one of those functions for all these things is not going to be, well, some of the functions might be uh, linear. Some might be, they might all be logarithmic. And logarithmic is great, but it's not as good as we can get. What beats out logarithmic? constant behavior, OK? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with a new type of data structure that will be better than all these for find, insert, and remove. OK? All right. We want to get this holy grail of asymptotic complexity being constant behavior. OK? To do this, we need a completely different way of thinking about how to store this data. Okay, before we're storing things in nice orderly arrays right after the other or with nodes that point to the next one and all that, this is going to be a totally different idea. Okay? We're going to it's called hashing and what you do is you use a hash function. A hash function is just a mathematical function that you apply to some number or some string or set of numbers. But you take, that ha you take the hash function, you apply it to this thing, and you get a single number out of it. Okay? A hash function gives you a single number. These numbers are called hash values, hash codes, or sometimes they're just called hashes. Okay? Do some mathematical function, get a number out. That number is your hash. Okay? All right. Hash, hash functions and hash codes need to be three things. They should be three things. They should be deterministic. In other words, if you apply the same hash function to the same input, it should give you the same value. Mathematically speaking, that's pretty easy to do. right? You can't come up with some random answer. But if you have some input, and then you do the hash function, and sometime later you have the same input, you need to get the same answer out. Okay? That's the first thing, deterministic. They also should be fast. They need to be fast because you're going to be doing this a lot. Now, fast just means you have to do you might have to do some operations on them, but you can't like it can't be based on anything but the actual value itself. It's just going to be some mathematical things like adding, doing modulus, subtracting, whatever. You can have various hash 
like the various mathematical things, but you need it to be relatively fast. It also should be distributed. And by what we mean in distributed is we mean if I put, if I give you one, two, three, four, and you hash those, and we're, I don't want them to be all bunched up together, the answers. I don't want the hashes to be five, six, seven, eight. I want them to be somewhere spread out in a, in a pretty big distributed way. Okay? Sometimes it takes people a little bit to figure out what that distrib distrib distributed way is and what it's all about. So I'm going to demonstrate it to you. Okay? We are going to take a key, do a hash function, which is also called the compression function, and then we are going to map it to some values that are fixed. Anybody notice around the room that I, I taped up a bunch of numbers? In fact, if you look under the door there, there's a number that's still there from last semester. It was handwritten because I forgot to bring my printouts. But it's still there. So don't, that's not one for today. Don't go to the handwritten one. And when I say go to it, what we're going to do is we're actually going to hash you guys. OK? This involves getting out of your seat. OK, woohoo. All right. Here's what we're going to do. You guys all have a birthday, correct? Hopefully you know your birthday. I am perfectly happy with you making up a birthday. In fact, you can make up a year if you want and a month or whatever. Just don't change it during the course of the little demo. OK? If you want to. Most most people should not make up theirs, but that's fine. If you wanted to, that's fine. OK? Just your birthday. You've got your own birthday. I'm going to hash you based on your birthday. Here's how it's going to work, OK? We are first going to hash you based on the decade of your birth year. In other words, if you were born in 1918, OK? 1918, you would do your year divided by 10, which would give you what? Integer math. It'd be 198. Sorry, 191. <laughs> right? But forget about the point. It's just an integer division. So if you did 1918, that would be 1918 would go to 191. And then you would mod 10. What is 191 modulus 10? 1. And therefore, you would go to bucket 1 over here. OK? And we're calling these buckets because you're going to have to go hang out near there. Please watch out for the camera and go ahead and get up and do this. Hash yourself based on the decade of your birth year. <laughs> oh, no. Let me guess. You're all in college. <laughs> right? If you're all in college, you were all born in probably 19, what, 95, 96, 97? Right around then, 94 maybe? Right? If you're, if, you're, if, you're all, if you're born in the 90s, what are you guys sitting there? Are you 2000? Five. Oh, you made up a new one? You're five? Yeah. Oh, you're five. OK, you made up a new one. OK. So <laughs> most of you guys, except people who made up their birthdays, hashed to the same bucket. Why? Because you're all born in the same decade, right? So is this deterministic? In other words, if I sat you down and said, hash yourselves by your birth year, are you going to end up at the same place? It is totally deterministic. Of course it is, right? Is it fast? Did it take you a long time to go, my year divided by 10 mod, mod 10? Not really. I mean, it might have taken a little bit of like thinking, but I mean, a computer can do that really fast, right? So it's fast. Is it distributed? Oh, it's not distributed at all. Like if the room was on like gimbals, you'd, we'd be like tipping that way, right? You guys are all over in that one corner. And these guys up here can't even get down to the bucket, right? So that's not distributed. Terrible hash function, okay, for people in this in this community, okay, college students, right? The next one we're gonna do is the last digit of your birth year. So now, if you were born in 1922, you would go to the bucket that's two, right? So go. There is a zero. Yeah. OK. So we've, we've shifted a bit, right? We've shifted a bit this way, right? 
are, and I love the fact that you two are in the same, these two grew up together in Texas, right? Or like they knew each other as kids, which is kind of funny. Um, so is this one deterministic? Sure it is. You're not going to change like the year of your birth, right? It might not be, things might change, determinism might change. Like let's say you get married and change your name. If we were hashing you based on your name, then things might be a problem. It might not be deterministic. So you have to be a little careful there. OK, was it fast? Yeah, it was fast. We developed mod 10. That's easy. Was it distributed? It's a little better. Are you guys in threes over there? Yeah, so we got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and, and seven are like the college years, right? Based on this year. And then we've got people who have like, obviously, they're made up theirs or are a little bit older or younger or whatever, right? And so that's that. OK, so it's a little more distributed, but it's definitely not perfect, right? I, don't, I see one person in the two and like 40 people in five, right? So that's not so good. How about this? Last digit of your birth month. So your birth month is 1 through 12. Go to the last digit of your birth month. <laughs> 89? All right. Now, deterministic? Yes. Fast? Yes. Distributed? Ah, much better, right? We're much more distributed now because we're doing that. Now, are we perfectly distributed? What's going to be, where, which, which months will have more than at their fair share? January and February. January and February. Well, one and two. I like that. Why one and two? Because you've got both January and uh, November, and you've got February and December both go to one and two. So there's probably a few more people over here. OK. Um, any gonna, are any going to have less, fewer, than some of the other ones? Zero. zero. Why zero? Uh, one well, it's only one month, right? Only, you guys are all born in October, right? Yeah, so there's, it's the only one month, right? So, um, so that's, that's, another one that's, <laughs> that's another one that's like, like that, OK? So some of the other ones too, obviously, the ones that there's only one month that works. OK, what's another one that might distribute us even better? Last digit of your birthday, go. All right. Now, this is looking more distributed. Everybody can like shake it out a little bit, right? The last digit of your birthday, right, is going to be much more distributed. Are there still going to be months or, or buckets that have more or less people in them? Yeah. Which ones? Nine. Why nine? Uh, leap year. Leap year. Okay, so nine's a little bit different. What about uh, what about some of the other ones? One. So one and what about one? You've got a 30s and you've got 31s, right? But you don't have, uh, you don't, and, and those are going to both go into the ones, or the zero and the one, right? So they're going to be a little bit, but overall, this is a pretty good spread, right? You can see people are kind of all over the place. Who else should be in four? Anybody from like 24, 14, or four? Only a couple people? Surprised. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's a much better hash function. OK, have Greg go back to your seats. While you're going back there, I'll tell you my, my favorite birthday story. When I was in the Navy, as I think I told you on the first day, when I was in the Navy, we, our ships started going, our ships would go from San Diego westward. And if you're going west on a ship, every couple of days, what changes? Time zone, right? Just like if you're driving east, east to west, every couple of days, the time zone changes. The way the Navy does it, is they don't just, whenever you cross over that invisible line for the time zone, they, change time. they only change the time at midnight. When you get to a relatively close to the new time zone, they'll change the time to midnight, at midnight. Okay? What's the line that you cross somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? The international date line. When you get to the international date line, we still, because it's a time zone change, you still change the time at midnight. But if you're going east to west, or I guess for you guys, east to west, going east to west, and you cross the international date line, let's say that it's Monday when you're about to cross it. When you get there at midnight, 
What day do you change to? Wednesday. Wednesday. You actually skip an entire day. On a ship of 4,000 people, guess what? That Tuesday was, was a bunch of people's birthday. <laughs> and the Navy took away their birthday. <laughs> right? Which, to me, is a pretty good story. Like, you can say, oh, the Navy, they took away my birthday. Right? That's a pretty good story for missing one, one of your birthdays. Right? So what's interesting is on the way back, let's say you're going east, west to east now, you come to the International Date Line, and at midnight, you change days. So if it's Monday, and you hit the International Date Line, what do you change to? You change to Monday. So you have some people had two birthdays, yeah. And not only that, so, so there's that. The calendar on that day was really wacky because you looked at the weekly schedule and it said Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. An eight-day week. And you're like, oh, an eight-day week. And like, they, they have to do the schedule based on that. Do you know what we called that second Monday? Not Tuesday. <laughs> we called it Groundhog Day. Because of the movie, like Groundhog Day. In fact, when I first was in the Navy, that movie had kind of just recently come out. So before that, they didn't call it anything, but now they kind of call it Groundhog Day. But anyway, that's my birthday story. Okay, so that's hashing, okay, in general. Now you kind of get the idea of what hashing's all about. Let's do some other kinds of, an interesting hash here. Let's, remember we had ox was a bovine, blah, 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 right? Let's hash two digit, or two letter words. Okay, we're going to use the following hash function. We are going to treat ox as it, or a two-letter two word as if it was a base 26 number. Okay, let me. This confused people in the other class a little bit. If I say 27, the number 27. How do I make the number 27 out of like tens? Two times what? Ten plus 7 times 1. That's how you make a 1's column and a 10's column, right? If I want to make ox, and, and we, uh, we are using base 26, OK? Ox would be some number times 26, because that's equivalent to the 10. It's the base, plus some other number times 1, which is the other one. So there's some number times 26, plus some number times 1. We're basically mapping two letter words to a unique place based on the letters. Because there's 26 different letters, and you can do it that way. So to get the word ox and to find out its hash value, you do the following. 26 times 14, because O is at position 14. If we're mapping A is 0, B is 1, etc. 26 times 14 plus 23, where x is, times 1. That gives you a number of 387. Ox hashes to 387. Remember, we need, a hash, we need to get a number out of a hash code, right? a hash function. There's your number for ox. Let's look at the, the, the word at, A-T. A is 0. 0 times 26 plus 1 times 19, which is where T is at 19. Gives you 19. That's the word at. At gets its own number, 19. Ox gets 387. Okay? Does that make sense? It's pretending that letters, that our, our number system is made up of, instead of just 0 through 9, it's 0 through 25, basically. Okay? Yeah, XO won't be the same. Now, I will tell you, we'll, we'll look at this a little bit later, but this will make a, a different hash value for every two-letter word. Because there's 26 times 26 different combinations of two-letter words, right? 26 letters for the first position, 26 letters for the second position. That gives you a total of 26 times 26 different positions. Every two-letter word will be completely represented by this. Okay. What we can do is therefore come up with an array that's 26 times 26 numbers long, 576 or something like that, right? And we can put, if we have a two letter word, we can hash it and then go to that location and say, this is your bucket, two letter word. Ox, you get bucket 387. And what are we going to put in that bucket? 
the definition. Actually, we're going to put both the word and the definition. We'll see why a little later. Okay? At, your box is 19. Whatever the word, whatever at means, you're going, you get box 19. All the two to two letter words get these boxes. Okay? That's called a hash table. And it's a very simple hash table, but it works, it's very, it's, it is very, very fast. Why is it fast? Because we can hash the, the uh, we can hash ox in constant time. We do 26 times uh, the first letter plus the second letter. Constant time, right? Then we just go to the bucket. In an array, we can get to that bucket instantaneously, okay, in constant time. So it's a constant uh, access. Woohoo, we've made it, right? End of story, end of lecture, right? Not quite. Let's talk about a couple other things, okay? As long as it's deterministic, that's fine, right? Which, which is what we've done, okay? And this means that, and this is basically what I went over a second ago. Hash a key, put the value into an array, that's constant time. Find the value in constant time because we do the same thing. Hash it and then look in the bucket, and if it's there, then we found it. And delete it in constant time. Hash it, go to that bucket, delete what's in the bucket. All constant time operations. Okay? We have arrived at this holy grail. Okay? Fast. But we're only doing two letter words. Okay? Are there words that are longer than two letters? All boggle words are longer than two letters. Right? Okay? We've got 26 by 26, 676, not 576, okay? And so we've got the 676, but what if, don't worry about that. If you've ever taken Lisp, you'll be able to see it, okay? This is the, I'm, I'm one step ahead of myself. This is the actual code for this. You don't need to stare at this now, but basically know that you've got letters times letters for the 676. Then you've got the actual hash code, which does the 26 times the first letter plus the second letter. And then you're kind of fun coming up with these um, insert and find and add sort of things. Okay? So this is, you can look at this a little bit later, but, um, but the idea is it's pretty straightforward to do this. Okay? Don't worry about the, the details of this now. But there are words that are longer than two letters. The longest word in the world, it's disputed. But there's 189,819 characters. Are there, any, are there any chemistry majors in here? Yeah, you guys are crazy. Making up words that have 189,819 letters, or, or digits. I mean, sorry, letters. How do you do that? Well, you, you like combine like chemical, 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 right? Crazy chemists. The longest published word is another chemical kind of formula. It's 1,909. Right? Longest word coined by a major author, whatever that means, is 183. Dictionaries normally have a uh, new mode. I can't say that. Like, yeah. Would that require like 26 to the 45th time? To we'll get there. Yeah, this is the problem that you're seeing here, right? If you're trying to store 45 letter words, you're going to need 26 to the 45th array values. It's kind of going to overflow. In fact, that's close to the number of particles in the entire galaxy. <laughs> right? So if you store, if every galaxy particle was made up of a piece of your array, you might be a get close to storing all these. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, 34 letters, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Shakespeare used a 27 letter word that actually had alternating consonants and vowels. Consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, con anyway. Right? Longest words, right? Anybody ever been to New Zealand? Yeah, I, when I was in New Zealand, I, made a perp I purposely went to this place. <laughs> took me three hours to drive there, but I saw the most amazing rainbow. This is uh, the longest place name in the world. What it means is the summit where Tamatea, the man with the big knees, whatever that means, the climber of mountains, the land swallower, who traveled about, played his nose flute, whatever that means, <laughs> To his loved one, that's what it means. And it's in somewhere, it's in New Zealand. If you look at the Let's Go book, it's in there and says, go visit this place in the middle of nowhere. I drove there, I took this picture and I left. I think this, this might not be my picture. I think I took a picture like this. I, I don't remember if that's mine, but anyway, that's the longest place name in the world. Yes? So it's working with the hospital's um, patient database 
-hmm. Yeah, their names are too long. Database, so you have to be careful that you don't do that. My name's Christopher, right? And for the longest time, the SAT only had 10 letters in the first name. So I would be Christopher <laughs> for the entire like, time I was taking the SAT and ACT and all that. I don't know why they didn't care, but whatever. So long words are going to cause a problem for this, right? If we try to store supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, we need 26 to the 34 buckets to store this. Okay? English only has about 700,000 total words. right? If you tried to store 700,000 words in 26 to the 34 buckets, you know how like sparse that array would be? You'd be able to go on and on and on for like the whole rest of your life before you'd find one word. Right? It's just it, it would be way too much extra space, obviously. Question? Are you allowed to say that a certain point is characteristic of the word? No. What if you said supercalifragilisticexpialidocious with an E? Let's say they come up with another letter on there. You can't really, there's no way to really yeah. like break it out. You, we are going to use, we're going to see how to get around this because obviously this is a problem. Yeah? Could you implement this as a sparse array? Uh, could you implement it as a sparse array? Mm, maybe. <coughs> the problem with that is you're going to run into other, other time complexity issues that you can't, that you're going to have to deal with. Yeah? Not a try, although tries are, are very good, right? Tries are definitely good. Uh, well, you st actually, tries aren't bad. You still have to look through each letter, but it's, tries are, are pretty close to hash tables in many ways, in the sense of how easy they are to look through. But we can hash, many, we can hash anything, not just words, in a, in a hash table. Okay? So a better definition for a hash function is now going to be any, any algorithm that is deterministic and it maps to a fixed number of locations. When I hashed you guys, aren't there only 10 locations? There are only 10 locations, and where did you end up in one of those 10 locations? Why? What do we always do at the end of our hash function? Mod 10, which says whatever your number is, just put it between 0 and 9, which is what happens when you do mod 10. Okay? For our dictionaries that were for our like dictionaries in this case, a 700,000 word dictionary, we might only need 800,000 elements. In fact, you could get away with fewer than that. But let's say to conservatively, if we used 800,000, we'd be able to fit them all in there. Okay, but we have to be able to store arbitrary words with any length. Okay, and so that's kind of the issue here. Here's what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to do our regular hash code, okay? And, and by the way, it's not going to be this 26 business anymore. We're going to come up with a better one than that. And then we're going to do mod to the actual position, or to the number of buckets that we have. And that will give it a specific bucket, okay? What was the big problem when the first thing that we hashed you guys for? What happened? You all ended up in one bucket, okay? That's going to be kind of an issue. We will get to that in a minute. OK? A couple of little mathy things here. The number of keys that we're going to store is going to be defined by lowercase n. The number of buckets that we have is going to be uppercase n. OK? What we're going to do is we're going to actually use this to find a bit of a ratio. OK? We'll get to that, we'll get to that in a minute. But what the hash table does is it maps those n value, lowercase n values into the uppercase n buckets by doing this modulus, and that is now called a compression function. Okay, it's called a compression function, and that compresses those numbers down. Okay? Let's do a little example. Here's going to be, this is going to be our table. Okay? It's, a, it's, uh, it's got 10 buckets in it, just like when we hashed you guys. Okay? We're going to be able to hash any integer into the, these buckets. The hash code we're going to use is very simple. It's going to be the integer mod 10. And we're going to insert the following. Where's 7 going to go in this? Position 7. Where's 18 going to go? Position 8. Where's 41 going to go? 1. And where's 34 going to go? Beautiful. OK, so far so good. How do we find where 41 is? I'm, yeah, how do we find 41? 
hash 41, go to one bucket and look and see if it's there. So we go find 41 and we go, yep, it's there, it's at one. Find uh, 15. Go to look in bucket five and it's not there. So we can find these things. Can we find max or find min? Not with a hash function, right? Not any hash function, really. You're not going to be able to use a hash function to do a min or max, L, uh, max idea. Because the whole mod part jumbles it all up. And there's no order here. Notice 41, 34, 17, 18, or 7, 18, they're not in any particular order. There's no ordering to this. Okay? The only way you could find a max or a min is if you go through all the elements one by one. It's linear. So you're going to run into a problem with that, right? What about if we add 54? Where's 54 supposed to go? Four. Right? Now we've got a problem. If there's, if there's the bucket holds one value, right? I mean, you guys, when you were hashing yourselves, you're like, you're all bunched over here, and you're like, we're all in one bucket, right? But, but you, you kind of were, but it was like a very expansive bucket, right? In this case, we have to create our own like expansive bucket. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that. You could say a hash table of arrays, right? Array, 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 array. And every time you get to this one, you've got an, an array here that does it. We, we could do a hash table of arrays. There's another one that happens to be slightly more often used. It's my least favorite data structure, linked list, right? You just have the list, and then you do a bing, 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 right? And you do that, OK? Yeah? Can we have a hash table of hash tables? You can have a hash table of anything. Sure, you can have a hash table of hash tables. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what if we added integers and all of our integers ended in 4? Right? We would then have this bucket would have all the integers in them, right? And now to find one, well, then we've got to talk about how to find something in there. Okay? Let's talk about that. Okay? By the way, this is called a collision. Okay? And I should have, I should have redone uh, this. This is, not, this is not hash because it's like integer 1, integer 2, right? You're hashing those. If, if you hash a value and it's equal to some other hash of some other, the same hash of some other value, we call that a collision. Okay, it's a hash collision. Yeah? It should be just like h of element versus h of element 2, element 1 versus element 2, yeah. It's kind of like we're, we're not taking a hash of a hash code. Change that right now. Element 1. Oh. You're not supposed to take this much time. Element one, element two. There we go. Okay. All right. So, so that's how we're uh, that that's what we're going to call a collision. Okay. How do we deal with these collisions? Well, we can create a linked list. This is called chaining. Okay. And chaining, you basically go to a bucket and it's a linked list. Now that bucket is a linked list, and in that linked list, you just simply have one element after the other in that, link, in that list. How do you find which one it is? Well, you've got a little bit of a problem, right? You can't just go here and say, OK, look in the 4 bucket. Is something there? Yes, I've got 34. You've got to actually store both the element and its key, or the key and the value. OK, so you have to store both instead of just the keys, or just the values, rather. Okay. So you store the key with its definition, is how we deal with this. All right. <laughs> this is kind of a, a, a weird drawing, but here's what we've got. We've got a table. We've got our hash table here, and each element in the hash table either is null because there's no, like, no uh, linked list, or it's got a linked list. How do we find if song is in this hash table? You hash song, and then you go to that bucket, which happens to be bucket zero in this case, and then you go down the linked list and you say, is book song? No. Is song song? Yes. What's the definition? Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Right? So that's how you would do the search. What if we wanted to search for dog? Let's say dog, let's say dog went to bucket 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or let's say 3. 0, 1, 2, 3. What if dog hashes to bucket three? 
you go to bucket three and you look here and you say is mammal or is cat dog? No. Oh, we're done. Is dog in the hash table? No. Now, this leads to the behavior that we have a problem with. If everybody hashed here, right, then we would go, we would end up having linear behavior. Ah, oh, everything we tried to avoid, right? What do we need to do? We need to make sure that our hash function is distributed, right? It can't all hash to the same bucket. K mod 10 is a terrible hash function, right? Because it all, anything with fours would, would do that. If you did k mod 2, and then you, in, and then you, you uh, uh, let's say, no, sorry, k mod 10, and you insert just even numbers, half your buckets would not be used. Right? So you've got to be a little careful with that. OK? All right, a couple more things here, and then we're going to be done. The operations on a dictionary or a hash table. Insert, find, and remove. To insert. Ha get the hash code, find the bucket, insert into that list. To find it, hash the value, search that list in the bucket, and if found, return it. Delete, hash the value. You get the picture here, we're always hashing these values. Hash the key, rather the key to get the value. Search the entry, remove it from the list. End of story. Okay. Pretty straightforward stuff there, right? If we try to store the entries with the same key, then we run into a little issue. You have to make some decisions here. If you're storing entries with the same key, you could either replace the old value with the new one. This is what Python does, by the way. Or you could insert both and then randomly get one when you do remove. Meh, doesn't seem like the best idea. Or you could do a find all that gives you all the ones with that value. But it totally depends on your application. You can do it a couple different ways. OK? All right. One more thing. You can't change the, what you're hashing on if you want to ever find your value again. I used the example earlier. Let's say that I hash you guys by your last name. And then you go and get married and change your last name. Right? If you do that, then I try to hash your last name, am I going to get to you again? Nope. nope. Different hash value completely. Right? So you're going to do that. OK? So that's that. All right. Last thing here, the load, and we'll start with this on, on Wednesday. The load factor of a hash table is the number of keys divided by the total number of buckets. If you had 1,000 keys and 1,000 buckets, what's our load factor? One. That's not so good, actually. You want your load factor to be relatively low. In other words, below 1. You want more buckets than the number of things you're going to store. Otherwise, you'll end up with lots of collisions. And you want the hash function, function to be very good. If you don't duplicate your keys, guess what? You end up with this constant time behavior. Okay? We will start with this on Wednesday. See you guys in lab and, or on Wednesday. <laughs>